All right, wonderful to see you all again. Um, I have an extraordinary panel today that is going to be able to touch on a number of aspects of the future of work and workforce that we haven't discussed yet today. Um, so I'll briefly introduce them and then let them talk about what they're working on and hopefully we can get into uh, an interesting and diverse discussion on how we make sure that the future of work is indeed a positive future for all aspects uh, of the workforce. So I have uh, Michaela Fernandez-Allen, who is the uh, Director of Government Affairs for Walmart. Um, prior to working at Walmart, she worked under President Obama at the White House, and prior to that with Leader Nancy Pelosi in the House. Uh, and then to her left, I have Tom Camber. Um, Tom is the Executive Director of OATS, the Older Adults Technology Services. Uh, they make sure that older Americans have access to the internet and technology. They've connected, I believe, over 20,000 older Americans to the internet uh, and set up a, a large number, I believe it's 30 or so, um, technology centers to make sure that older Americans can indeed get a chance to learn about and interact with these technologies. Um, and then I have Eli Lehrer, who is the founder and president of the R Street Institute. Uh, R Street Institute is a free market think tank that focuses on solutions, practical solutions, to all of the major problems and issues in our country today with a particular emphasis on technology issues. Uh, and I have to say, when I want smart analysis on tech policy, whether it is on AR, VR, or on patents, or on immigration, or you name it, uh, Eli and his staff are always very quick with a sharp analysis. So uh, a little personal plug, I don't know if that's fair or not, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, <laughs> I want to go out to all of you, since you all are coming from very different perspectives on, on future of work issues, with a broad question that I think will help frame our discussion, and that is for each of you to identify one segment of the workforce that you think has been left out of our discussions today, one segment that you don't think gets brought up often enough when we talk about future of work. Um, I can, I'm happy to start. Yeah, please. Um, so, you know, at Walmart, many of you probably know this, you know, we have a very big workforce. Uh, we employ 1.4 million associates here in the U.S. Um, and so when we talk about kind of future of work and the workforce discussions, we are really thinking about most of our associates who are in our stores. So those frontline hourly um, associates, those uh, department managers um, who work in our stores. Um, I'd also like to just point out, and you guys all know this, that you know, the retail landscape has changed dramatically um, over the last few years. And so uh, to better meet the demands of our customers and the way that we all shop, which is we want you know, what we want, uh, when we want it, you know, as soon as possible in less than two days, um, we've, we've had to meet those demands. And so we're really looking at how do we upskill uh, this kind of frontline hourly associate uh, so that they're ready to meet the demands today but also meet the demands of tomorrow. And Tom? Great, thank you. Well, maybe we can get some of our workers to work in your stores. Yes, that'd be great. <laughs> um, We'd love that. I work with uh, people over the age of 60, and, and um, for the last 14 years, we've been teaching technology classes to senior citizens for free. And when they come in, we always ask, you know, what do you want to learn, and why do you want to learn that set of skills? And uh, the top three topics that people ask for are social engagement, health, and financial security, which is typically workforce. They're looking for jobs. Um, about uh, 13 years ago, we were teaching a class in Bedford-Stuyvesant. We taught a basic class on how to use the computer and went and surveyed the seniors who took the course and said, so what do you want to take next? Do you want to take an advanced course or something about you know, Facebook or something? And um, nine out of the 12 people said they wanted to find a job and they were looking for wow. work. And so our second ever course that we taught, the 10-week course we developed, is on workforce skills. And we find it a, a, to be a real uh, need. So I would say the, the underserved group here are um, folks who've been either out of the workforce for a little while, uh, they're recent retirees. Uh, there's lots of data that um, AARP and others, uh, the people funded by the Sloan Foundation as well, have found that there's a real desire for older workers to get back into the workforce. And during the recent recession, there were these very long stretches of time for people who were looking for jobs. And those are also really connected to the lack of technology skills. And so those twin dynamics of uh, People over the age of 60 looking to get back in, either part-time or full-time, needing the technology skills to get uh, a job, and also, frankly, facing a lot of ageism and uh, stereotyping about their age when they're looking for jobs are really uh, some barriers and real critical issues these days. And Eli? Uh, men. Uh, <laughs> huge numbers of men are becoming disengaged from the workforce at a rate that is almost frightening. 
women within a decade or two probably will be an absolute majority of the workforce, up from about 33% uh, at the end of World War II. The results and consequences of male workforce disengagement are enormous. Virtually all of the decline not caused by retirement in workforce participation is a decline in the workforce participation of men. There are several reasons why this has happened. Uh, I'll go over three very, very quickly. First, uh, a lot of men have criminal records, are offenders. Men are 94% of those in federal prison and 91% of those with a felony record overall. There is a huge curriculum of professional licensing, of mandatory fingerprinting regimes, of all sorts of things that give a man who might have made a serious mistake, the equivalent of Jean Valjean's yellow ticket of leave, a virtual prohibition on working in the more than one third of all jobs that require, that require a license of some sort. Second, men don't do as well in school as women do. 57% of undergraduates and a majority of all people getting advanced degrees are female today. It's true that men continue to dominate the STEM fields and the highest prestige, highest profile things, and that's a significant problem that ought to be dealt with socially. Um, so this is not against the idea of women in STEM efforts. But if you look at the bottom end of the workforce, really, the, and I'm saying the bottom 70% of jobs, uh, those jobs are far more friendly and attractive and dominated by women and tend to exclude men. Uh, finally, there have been cultural changes and there's some very interesting University of Chicago research showing this. A lot of men are simply spending too much time playing video games. Uh, it's not your imagination. This is, uh, this is actual peer-reviewed research uh, at the University of Chicago. Life satisfaction for low-skilled males is actually um, about what it's been despite massive declines in workforce participation, and it's reasonable to posit that increasingly diverting video games are causal in this case. Uh, and this is an enormous social and cultural problem. You look at declining rates of male volunteerism, all of these things are problems of men. So I'd say men. And my wife, uh, when she says men are useless, which she tells me all the time, and that me in particular, I gotta say that she's on to something. <laughs> well, I wanna go to Michaela, and uh, I think that she's gonna offer part of the solution. I, I, I don't know that her male customers that buy video game consoles at Walmart are gonna agree with all this, but uh, I think that Walmart actually does have uh, quite a bit to, to offer and tell us about as far as what you're doing, creating opportunities for different populations. You know, particularly I'd be curious to hear what Walmart is doing that other major employers are not as far as creating opportunities for different populations. Yeah, so, you know, as I kind of mentioned, you know, we're, again, really focused on this kind of frontline worker. Um, and one of the things that we're doing, which is really different, is we're taking a holistic approach. Um, so two years ago, we um, invested $2.7 billion in our associates. I think when we made that announcement, everyone looked at the wage. The wage is important, um, but really, um, we think what's going to make the biggest difference, actually, is the training. Um, and so I think the kind of key piece that we're doing is this training piece. Um, so last year, we launched what we call academies. Uh, these are essentially, you know, training facilities that are attached to a Walmart store. Um, they are powered by technology training. They are experiential. It's classroom training. Um, it's on the floor training. Um, but it's dedicated training, two weeks intensive for frontline department managers. So the middle, kind of middle skilled uh, managers in a Walmart store. The reason why that's important is because what we're seeing is that a lot of our associates, this is the first time many of them have graduated from anything, have been trained. Um, this is the first time an organization has taken the time to do that. And what it does for those associates is it obviously gives them kind of a clear pathway. Once they finish that training, they have a graduation, they go back to their store. We're seeing already just a year into the program that people are being promoted after that. 
And then, you know, they have possibilities to leave. I mean, obviously, we, you know, we would love everyone to stay at Walmart, but after this training, they have better possibilities to go somewhere else. So we think that's really important. Um, the other thing that we're doing is, again, really important to focus on those kind of middle managers. Uh, many associates um, will tell you, you know, people leave companies because of bad managers. And so we know that's really important. The other piece that's really important are those kind of those folks that come in for the first job that don't come in with a lot of skills. We were really finding that those folks just didn't have the soft skills or the kind of basic retail skills that they needed to be able to do well in our organization or really anywhere. Um, and so we launched a program called Pathways, which is really focused on that kind of frontline, hourly person that comes into our stores with not a lot of experience. The whole idea here being that you know, we want to create opportunities within our stores, but we really want to create opportunities for these folks so that, you know, as the workplace continues to change, as we continue to add new technologies, that they're able to stand alongside those technologies and do that work, uh, but potentially also um, do something else. Um, so really important, I think, that we're focused um, on the upskilling piece uh, for the frontline associates. So Eli, upskilling certainly is one way if some of these people, particularly if they have a criminal record, are able to get in the door maybe to, to elevate themselves. Um, I know online platforms are another way to create opportunity for people that might have a record that would prevent them from even getting in the door. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between those two types of opportunities uh, and what we might be able to do to encourage uh, people to get involved in them who might not necessarily be able to get uh, a job otherwise? Of course. I should say that both ways of doing things are absolutely vital, and we can't say, oh, we're going to do everything through virtual training, or that we'll do everything through, um, through in-person training. We need to take advantage and meet people where they are. When it comes to people who may have records or who may have other problems, who may not have done that well in school, the bottoms of the people at the bottom of the class who are overwhelmingly going to be male. And, at the bottom of high school classes. Uh, when you look at uh, people who you know, might not have the skills, might not have the work ethic, um, you need to meet them where they are. You can't say, oh, you have to do, you know, you have to be able to sit in a classroom for this long, or you have to wear a VR headset for this long. Meet the people where they are. The main thing we need to do, though, I think, is get out of people's way. Uh, there are huge numbers of barriers, many of them imposed by governments that do this. Professional licensing, according to Institute for Justice, one third of all jobs require a professional license to practice. That's an enormous problem. Uh, various types of background checks that might be intrusive include fingerprinting uh, and may well access databases that are often inaccurate. Um, and because of bias, particularly on account of race throughout society, uh, you have enormous problems with that. Uh, finally, when we look at training programs, uh, going back to the idea of meeting people where they are, we've had enormous efforts to reach some underserved populations, but not all of them. Um, you know, there are no, there are tons of efforts, for example, very good efforts that we should encourage to bring more women into STEM fields. That's necessary, that's great. Uh, we have a shortage in healthcare fields and among teachers as well. Uh, there is no effort uh, focused on men broadly at a national level to bring men into teaching or, uh, or, uh, or many healthcare careers. So, we need to do these things, and when it comes to the one out of uh, 16 men who will have some sort of record, uh, we need to look for ways to sometimes get beyond that record. So uh, as a follow-up to that, you know, we have some instances of companies taking on initiatives to empower their workers and give new opportunities to their workers. You mentioned government getting out of the way, um, but you also mentioned a number of things that to me sound like they would need to be proactive initiatives. Mm -hmm. We have a policy-oriented crowd here. 
are there ways that the federal government in particular can act to lower some of these barriers, act to encourage businesses to create more of these opportunities? Well, the Obama administration did a very good report on professional licensing that talks about things like interstate compacts for licensing. It's very hard to repeal these things altogether. Uh, it also may be necessary to work to preempt some bad local, local efforts. I'm talking about, for example, the way that the city of Austin uh, drove out um, TNC services, which are a fantastic place for somebody who may have trouble getting an ordinary job to work, the way that through intrusive background checks, they just got them out of town. Those could be preempted both federally and at the state level. Finally, uh, we need to look at the enormous profusion of federal job training programs we have. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, um, by some counts, as many as 95 different federal job training programs and streamline this curriculum, probably in part by devolving large parts of it to private employers and to the states. So I want to pivot then to another population that may be able to benefit without any government intervention, at least we can start there. Uh, Tom, earlier today, Airbnb was talking about how their single largest growing demographic for hosts is senior women. How have you found that you go from a senior, let's say, who has no access to the internet, working knowledge of this, taking the leap all the way to, say, being an Airbnb host or an Etsy seller or something. Like, that's a pretty big gap. How do you get there? How do you get there efficiently? Well, it's, uh, it's surprising to see the difference in learning patterns between younger and older people. One of the things that we've learned is that people over 60, they bring a lifetime of experience and knowledge to the table when they start the learning process. So if you try to apply uh, pedagogical techniques that are designed for kids, uh, they don't work very well because they're not helping that person uh, start where they're really starting but accelerate as quickly as they can. I'm thinking of a woman who uh, came in a few years ago who uh, just started as a beginning computer trainer and uh, she wanted to get online and get email and very quickly realized she could get an Etsy account. And she started selling bags on Etsy and she sold her first bag at our center in Manhattan wow. and started jumping around and saying, oh, I sold something, I sold something. And she's now the head of um, our group of uh, senior entrepreneurs who started businesses at the center. Um, we teach Wix uh, web design to people and every time I go in I ask people kind of what they're there for and they're all something related to uh, the uh, you know entrepreneurship or economic productivity. So there's a real desire on the part of a subset of older people to do that kind of work. And as soon as they get the basic skills, they immediately go into what's relevant and necessary for things like Airbnb or mm -hmm. whatever the tools are that they're looking for. It's it's very popular. And seniors, if they they start very slowly with technology because they ha they're not digital natives. So the notion of using a mouse or an input device or figuring out what kind of platform to go on uh, takes a while because mm -hmm. there's a lot at stake and it's very new, it's kind of like learning a language. But after two months of basic support and training, especially if you're training in a, uh, in a group environment, they really pick up real quickly. We've worked a lot with the Consumer Technology Associations. There's a foundation here. Yeah. And they've been really supportive of us with our entrepreneurship programs. And I've noticed people go from basic right into, how do I start designing a, web, a website? And that woman actually asked me to help her with a uh, the JavaScript on her website recently, and I said, I'm like I, more than I can you're, do. You're, I don't know how to do Java programming. I said, you got to go find somebody else for this. So there's really a, um, a kind of a steep curve after a certain stage of it. And is there a government role here, right? There's an enormous amount of attention given to older Americans, at least in, in policy discussions. Mm -hmm. But this isn't something that I hear about very often at all on Capitol Hill. It, is, should it be? Is there a role they should be taking, or should it be a backseat and you continue doing everything you're doing with our support, and that's enough? We've, we've found some real success in terms of these government public-private partnerships. I think when government works together with companies and nonprofits, the nonprofits are close to the ground. We work every day with the seniors. We've got 15,000 people at our center right there in Manhattan every year, very diverse. Um, but with some corporate support, support and sponsorship and the government agencies working together, we tend to come up with programs that I think are a little bit more um, responsive to people's needs and more efficient. Uh, I will say I think there's a really important government role here because the, uh, the society is aging very rapidly. 
And so there's this concept of a de uh, what they call a dependency curve, where essentially um, over time more and more of the population becomes dependent on the productive uh, uh, portion of the population. And of course, if your dependent proportion is, is large and your yeah. productive proportion is comparatively smaller, you start to have problems in terms of productivity. So one way to adjust for that dependency curve is to do everything possible to keep seniors working as long as they're capable and interested mm -hmm. and supporting them that way because they are putting into the economy rather than simply taking out of it. So there's really a role for public agency there. I just think it really requires a certain level of flexibility. There, there is already a, a very large federal program uh, called uh, com um, CSEP, the uh, uh, Community Service Employment Project, which uh, trains lower income seniors for workforce uh, participation. But I really think that um, there's a need for really uh, some, some updates and innovation in that area. No, I love the Etsy story. That's great. I, yeah. And it's new, right? I had assumed that Theoretically, something like that could happen, but to hear about the, that success you know, right here, um, and then to think about ways that you can publicize that and, and replicate it, uh, you know, I think that's something we'd like to see a lot more of. Um, I, I want to do a major pivot, and we're uh, very close to ending here, but I want to get back to Michaela and on the subject of, of technology. We've heard a lot today and in other discussions about future of work about technology and workers, and there's this dichotomy that's like one or the other. Uh, I have seen a number of commercials recently from Walmart that showcase a lot of your associates, and they are using technology in most of them. Uh, I'd love to hear from you about currently how technology is supporting and aiding workers at Walmart and how you see the future of technology interacting with workers at Walmart. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's something that we're talking a lot about at Walmart. Um, you know, we very much see technology, um, obviously, as a part of our future. I mean, all of the training that we're doing is powered by technology. Our associates are using iPads for training. Um, as they're doing that pathways, entry-level training, uh, they're both, you know, doing their jobs, stocking the shelves, but they're also spending time on these modules um, with a handheld device. And so technology is really um, very much a part of what we're doing. Um, we're also creating new jobs through technology. Um, for example, we have a program uh, called grocery home pickup in many markets around the country. I think we've got about 700 markets right now where customers can go online, order their groceries, and pick them up. Well, that's a new category of jobs created um, through technology that we just didn't have before. So we both have associates, I think, kind of training and using technology in a way that they haven't before. And then we have these new categories of jobs that are being created in our stores through the use of technology. Um, so certainly a big part of what we're doing. Um, and what, we, what you'll hear us say a lot is that we really see um, kind of a people-led, um, but technology-enabled environment where you know, people are there, they are part of it. We are seeing that customers want that associate that can spend time with them, figuring out how to work this electronic item that they're buying. Um, but we know that the technology can be there to help um, make those transactions smoother, right? So we may not need as many cashiers, um, but we may have um, you know, associates doing other things in the store. So very much people-led, um, we have the technology to enable that work. Um, and I'll just also say, I mean, no one knows what the future mm -hmm. holds. I mean, there's a lot of speculation, um, but what is most important is that we are prepared. Um, and so that's why the training that we're doing, we really feel like is foundational and really important um, to the work ahead. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap up with that in a very quick panel here. Uh, and I want to give the audience a chance. We have, uh, I believe, eight minutes left. If any of you guys have questions, uh, our panelists would certainly uh, welcome hearing from you about you know, whatever you're curious curious to ask in the front here. I can usually be pretty loud. Um, same question, uh, Michaela, to you that I asked Max uh, with a little bit of a spin. So getting folks ready for your training programs in K-12, uh, soft skills and hard skills that you would like to see focus more on um, for folks leaving high school and potentially coming directly into the job market for Walmart? So, you know, a lot of it with the soft skills is pretty basic stuff. It's, you know, having, being able to come to work on time, um, being able to dress appropriately, being able to speak with people in an appropriate manner, being able to work in a team, uh, being able to problem solve. Um, are, are some of the things that are, we're kind of focused on in our pathways training. Um, on the hard skills side, you know, 
you know, obviously, you know, any job you come into, you can kind of learn on the job. Uh, but what, the reason why we kind of set up this, this entry level training is because it was a combination of not having the soft skills, but also not really understanding what it was to be a retailer, what it was to work in this business environment, and the kinds of things you needed to do to have a successful store. And so we start doing that um, in that pathways training, and then we really accelerate it when we do the department managers training. Um, but we're certainly, um, you know, we're very much at Walmart in a learning phase. Um, the Walmart Foundation is doing some really great work. Um, you know, we're just learning from so many people right now, figuring out do we partner with community colleges? What is the right place for us to be as we try to figure out um, possible opportunities to partner um, not only with community colleges but other groups uh, that are focused on K through 12 education because people are coming to our stores for these frontline entry level jobs not ready to work. In the back. Hi, Rick Lane. Um, one of the, my passion issues is criminal justice reform. And I just want to say for, to Eli and the R Street guys for doing a great job of making this an important issue. It's also an issue that the left and the right agree on. You know, Leader Pelosi, Speaker Ryan, I think we could get them in a room and we could come up with legislation. But one of the key issues on recidivism is family and jobs. And it's easy, and a lot of work's being done with CTA on helping veterans get jobs, working to get seniors, and everyone's, oh yes, let's help get seniors and veterans get jobs. But when you talk about people with criminal records, all of a sudden, you know, their heads go down and they're not as into trying to help them because of the, the stigma of people coming out of jails and prisons. So my question to Akala is, what type of opportunities are there for people at Walmart to get jobs, to get into society, to fill self-worth, and to help provide for their families? Yeah. So I was actually so glad to be on the panel with Eli because, you know, this is something at Walmart when we talk about opportunity, it's, it kind of is pretty broad for us. And so back in 2010, actually, uh, we um, did something that I think at the time was pretty, pretty new. We removed the question on the application at Walmart that asked whether or not you were convicted of a felony. So I think many people know that as kind of ban the box. Um, so we did that in 2010, and we continue uh, to be a part of the conversations around how can we go beyond the box uh, so that we can help folks, um, you know, get their get their lives together um, after after prison. So it was it was great. I was glad that you were going to talk about that today. Yeah, it's it's a vital thing, and to a large extent, we need to go beyond what individual employers can do, and also look at the government's role in this. Uh, most other developed countries allow criminal records for adults to be sealed after a certain amount of exemplary behavior. Uh, in the UK, it's called offense spending. Uh, the US and Canada are the only two countries where relatively minor criminal offenses uh, follow you around for life in most cases. Uh, I think that that's something uh, worth doing. Uh, from what we're learning about brain development, a lot of people, particularly a lot of young men, frankly, are just dumb and do really dumb things. <laughs> they grow out of it. I, I mean, <coughs> this, is, this is an obvious case. Um, and uh, they grow out of it, and if they, if they do something really bad or continue to behave terribly, then it's perfectly legitimate. But at some point, I think it's ultimately the government. Then the box, I think, on an individual employer level can be great across entire labor markets. It's actually had relatively mixed results. Um, so I'm not sure that mandating it is the best way to do it. But moving towards a system of what the UK calls allowing minor offenses to be spent, I think, is probably something that we should strongly consider. Right, we have a chance for one more quick question in the far back. Hi there, Skip West. Um, this has been great. I want to ask you all about the sort of the 50 to 60 year old folks who have been somewhat marginalized. They don't have the skill set for the new economy. You know, you've got a situation where they need to understand technology, use technology. They may not. They may not have learned that. How do we keep them as productive members of our workforce going forward? And since many of them are going to need to work for a number of years anyway because of sort of the economic situation they're in as well. So how do we make them really productive and useful for, for, for our society? I can take that one. Um, I, you know, I was at a, a panel recently in, in, uh, uh, in Australia, actually, where somebody did a great presentation on how we organize our social supports for people's learning. 
And it, we stack so much of our public and private effort into training people between the ages of you know, eight years old and 24 years old. And then when a person enters the workforce, we sort of abandon them and assume that they're going to learn it on their own from there on out. And it turns out that, in fact, with the lengthening of the lifespan, we've added more years to the span of the human life in the last 100 years than we did in all of human history before that. And so there's this new 20 or 30 year period that we're having to figure out what to do with, but our social systems are still in a 19th century model for front loading all that education and support. So there's been really interesting uh, suggestions out there around, for example, making some of our student loan programs available to people past, uh, past the ages of 55 or 60, um, creating uh, university and public university models where people go back for a year or two of college or training to re, re kind of enhance their skills and get them going again. Um, there's also really a need for people to dialogue about this because there's such a, um, a predisposition amongst employers that uh, they think older people aren't interested in working or don't have those skills. So first of all, we have to get out there and create opportunities for people to get the skills, but also change the dialogue through some of our communications, which is where the, those sort of nonprofit and, and uh, corporate partnerships come out, where we can help reshape that conversation. We have a website where we put a lot of content up around challenging the images of aging because people associate it with decline and uh, kind of the path off to the golf course or the nursing home. And what's really happening is that you've got literally millions of seniors out there starting businesses and being really productive and getting back into the workforce, but the employers aren't looking for it yet. So we've got to educate not just the workers, but also create a kind of a positive feedback dynamic with some of the employers as well. Well, thank you all for joining us. This is a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you.